introductions. However, our first speaker is going to be John Bell from the National Seafood Inspection Lab, and he's already introduced himself. And so one thing I just wanted to emphasize, which something Dave already brought up, is to please take notes on any kind, as we're going along, on any kinds of discussion points that you'd like to have us talk about when the session, when we get to, we have half hour at the end of the session, or um, either questions or discussion points, or some kinds of points that are brought out of raise that you might uh, want us to consider for the next um, seafood um, conference that we're going to have. Um, so without further ado, we'll go ahead and have John come on up and do another little story about himself. <laughs> <laughs> you hope it's little. <laughs> thank you, Denise. Appreciate that. Um, and, and thank you for um, everyone being here and um, con consenting to at least listen to me um, a little bit. And David for inviting me. Thank you very much. Um, so I am now the director of the National Seafood Inspection Lab. Um, for those who are in, in the seafood industry, do you remember who used to be the laboratory director there? I know you're Spencer Garrett. So I, I hesitate to introduce myself as the new Spencer Garrett, but you know, I'm sorry, it's, it's kind of an inside joke. But so um, I mentioned previously that before this, I've only been there two years, a little over two years now as the director of the lab. Um, so, David asked me to talk a little bit about um, traceability type stuff that I might be able to uh, share. Um, so, um, this is the, what I was going to cover, the three parts of the talk is um, kind of go over the uh, traceability from the Presidential Task Force that, that has been happening over the last couple years, and then something that's more a little bit um, at, our, at our laboratory where we work, and that's a trade monitoring program. And then the third one, which is a little more germane, is um, a technology project, a back to the future type project that we're actually has been going on at the laboratory for a number of years and, and where we are with that. Now, <clears throat> Jack has left, but in the uh, in interest of Jack, a little more introduction. So I said I, I, I worked as a seafood extension professor at LSU, and I was hired there in 2002, actually got my PhD here from Raleigh in 2000. And before then, I worked for um, Starkis in the canned tuna industry. Um, actually uh, in a cannery in American Samoa on fishing boats and as well as the corporate office. And um, so that's my background is really more with, um, well, seafood science and technology and then outreach. And when I, I got fed up working for LSU and um, in 2008 moved back to California for a couple years, taking my wife from New Orleans where I, I always hesitate when she talks about San Diego, say, honey, I didn't take you to Cleveland. I apologize to anyone from Cleveland. But I mean, you know, it's San Diego. And she, of course, she's from New Orleans. So if it isn't New Orleans, it's just not worth living at. But I work for Chicken of the Sea. And um, a lot of my work, other than a recall and quality assurance type stuff, I put together training programs for our um, sales as well as our quality people, actually, basically the whole building at the corporate office, because no one knew what a tuna cannery was. It's got, you know, it's become such a sales and marketing company now because so much of this industry is offshore. And I, I gained more respect in that company for the, the getting up and talking about how tuna is canned than anything else I did there. Other than when I say, you know, some bonuses for the bosses, then they liked me. But other than that, other than that, I cost them money. So the segue to that is the presidential task force, the traceability um, component is, is something that I used to deal with a little bit on a regulatory sense. And I am not, so our fishery service is in Ocean Spring, um, S Silver Spring, oh, so, sorry, Silver Spring, there's only one, in, um, in um, Maryland. <laughs> it's right next to DC though. Um, so this isn't my program. Um, I'm just kind of giving you a perspective that we have as, as kind of the programs who have to deal with it within the federal agency. And it's not me. I mean, I'm the director. I'm the bureaucrat. So I try to go over just kind of my perspective on this. And it's not the official one. Just get that disclaimer out. If you want to really understand it, you're going to need to talk to the people in one spring that's silver in Maryland. Thank you. <laughs> So to get started with this, um, and this, this is the Presidential Task Force. Um, it's a very well known, it happened. Um, the plan was released in, in March 15, 2015. 
It's a website that will take you to the report. And it ended up with 15 recommendations how to approach really illegal and unreported fishing and then also seafood fraud. And that was kind of the traceability kind of comes in with that. But of these 15 recommendations, it's not just traceability there. There's international implications and organizations within the federal government in dealing with this enforcement, of course. Um, partnering, a big part of it is partnering with mostly state agencies, but also industry, clientele. And then traceability is a big part of that. So, and, th and that's the cover of, of the task or the, rec the recommendations. I actually read it. It's a pretty interesting uh, um, um, document, uh, especially for a non-federal employee or, or a new federal employee. So again, so it's seafood traceability in a federal sense. And being only there two years and having industry and academic background, it's like, what? And really, the traceability is, is, is addressed in the 14th and 15th recommendations. Um, <clears throat> so you think that maybe the National Seafood Inspection Lab might be involved in that having to do with seafood for an, in, for an organization that deals with fisheries. And there was some. Um, but there has been progress made to this point. If you've been following some of this, um, part of the tasks that were mentioned in 14 and 15 in, specifically talked about identifying the principles, risks, key data, and there was some involvement from NISL on that, of things, the things that would have to be involved a traceability program, the things that, would, you know, the data, the, the, a lot of different information. And that goal was that was to identify priority species for the initial efforts. And that has been done. I believe it's out for comment now. I think that's where it's at. I don't, it hasn't been finalized yet. And there's 13 different species that for the next part of, for to get this traceability going. However, and that's the bottom part here, that I, I guess that's where I'm going with this, is mo much more is involved than just these traceability focused recommendations. If you remember, I talked about in the previous one, sorry, go back. You know, things like in, international aspects of it, enforcement, that's a big part of a traceability scheme program partnering, trace, it, that all comes into traceability. It's not just something that happens without the previous 13 recommendations. So with that, this, this is a bad segue, but that's so the, the thing that's also going on that was part of these other recommendations was this implementation of an international trade data system and how this um, IUU will fit into that. So this ITDS system, if, an, if any of you do importing of fisheries products, you are impacted of this on, on my, my mom's birthday. That's September 20th. And uh, she's I'm 82, I think that was it. And I call, I remember calling, they live in California, call them up to say happy birthday to mom and dad, who's 86. He's like, yeah, and it's our 57th anniversary. It's like, dang, dad, you know, we never bring that up. We just talk about mom's birthdays. So it's interesting, it's a very interesting part of my life is seeing what um, dementia and, and uh, you know, age was, is impacts huh? what people remember. But um, this is a U.S. government-wide initiative under the National Customs Automation Program. So this is a customs goal to have everything come in with a, to one portal. And it's, par it's been part of the um, Presidential Task Force, this a goal of this whole controlling IUU fishing and traceability and fraud is a single window of an electronic system to process imports and exports. That's regulated by any, and this is regulated by any federal agency. So NIMS, we deal with seafood, right? But there's other things involved. I mean, I think I'm getting ahead of myself, but if you uh, import steel, Customs is going to require a certain amount of information to do the business, the you know the commerce, but and I'm not sure which federal agency it is is in, is involved in more documentation required about tariffs and various things if you import steel or ball bearings. So there's like a whole bunch of things other than just seafood. Yet Customs is worried about what Customs worried about, and that's the initial chunk of data that you have to have to import products. So I am ahead of myself. Sorry. Um, so what does the uh, ITDS do affecting NIMS? So that's the seafood and what we're doing. 
Well, the first thing it does before the data, and I apologize, get them ahead of myself, there is permits. Previously, if you're importing um, permits that dealt with the Arctic marine living resources, which is basically toothfish, and then highly migratory species, which has a lot to do with um, the ICAT and, and um, tuna, and then it also threw in the dolphin tuna stuff. So now, before, if you were having imports of any of those, you have to have two or maybe even three permits. Now you only need one. So September 20, your previous ones went out the window and you had one new one. That's an improvement. Uh, referring to Jack again, I keep looking at his empty chair there. You know, I mean, that, that, that's a positive. Of course, when September 20, 20 came, it wasn't all together yet, so you know, we're making, making it work. But you're going to need one permit where you previously needed two or three if you deal with these, these species. So that, that's one goal that's actually been accomplished from the um, Presidential Task Force. And then we've got this one new permit, and it's the International Fisheries Trade Permit, or IFTP. So if you are a dealer or an importer of these species, this has streamlined what you need to do. So that's one aspect of it. It's permitting. The second part about this rule or program, the International Trade Datum System, affecting um, the import monitoring is the data and documents. So now you have the one permit. Um, you can you, you're lock, electronically going to go into customs through what they call the automated commercial environment. And again, I've been a federal employee for two years. I'm constantly, anytime they involve me in any group discussion, it's like, what? Because they use acronyms like you can't believe. So I always make sure I, I, I explain them, or at least read them out, because so it's an automated commercial environment, so that's this single portal. It's part of a, the Presidential Task Force for, sea, for Fisheries and Illegal and Unreported Fishing, but it's, it's across the government for, for commerce. It's a big change for both dealers and importers and agency, and also the agency personnel trying to monitor it. And that's where that comes home to where I am at the National Seafood Inspection Lab, because we have the trade monitoring program there. So just for, because I need to have pictures up here, and believe me, it's hard to come up with a picture for that. So there's the web page <laughs> of the new site. If you're at all interested about learning more about this, it's, it is pretty straightforward. It's making it work. It's taken, of course, there's bugs and stuff, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a positive. And um, there's, a, there's a picture, although it's a very small part of it, of, of seafood. They, we love to do that, right? Always showing pictures of seafood. And this is more talking about the final rule. So there's a lot of information of it. If you're an importer you, yourself or you have a dealer that might do it, this is information they better already know, and they most likely do. <laughs> So what does, it, what does this, all this mean? And I've been trying to say it as we've gone along. One permit, species under these programs, go into this portal, electrically enter your key data and codes, you know, harmonized codes if you know about importing stuff through, through customs. But then there's also these other documents. And in monitoring toothfish or big eye tuna or these other species, there's a lot of things that goes in to this traceability, like where the name of the boat that caught it, where they were, which country flag, there's a whole bunch of information. And again, the bottom part, which always spoke to me, it's not just seafood. So it's just that the NIMPS section, the NICS uh, service, is, is among the leaders. I, I mean, if we're in the, not the first one to make this go live, we're among the first few. But a whole bunch of other agencies have got to work with customs, because customs doesn't want to build this thing that's going to cover 26 to 45 agencies. I don't even know what the number is. I've seen it multiple different ones. So they're going to say a certain amount of data, and then the other information, you're going to upload that document electronically, or scan it, or some way get it in there. So now it's all electronic, even though for you, if you're an importer, but for the people monitoring that scanning you know, import, um, uploaded data um, documents. So that's where we're at with that. Again, a horrible segue, but I didn't, didn't really have one. So now I'm going to tell you about something that's closer to home, the trade monitoring program at NISL, where, where I work, and where Ms. Angela Rupel is here with us as well um, as our analytical person. This, this is, again, the trade monitoring side. So this is the primary existing NIMPS traceability effort. And it's, this is the big difference. This is where I'm going with this, so this ITDS and, and traceability from IUU. This exists because we need to meet the federal obligations, the U.S. obligations, as a member of these regional fishery management organizations. 
RFMOs. Basically, that means these are consor consortiums of many countries, not just the U.S. We're the market. We're for a lot of to toothfish, especially, but tuna as well. So we're the market. So we can trade the, the monitor, the trade, the documents, the data, because it's it, it's business. It's importing. But if we want to know which fish, I'm sorry, what boat caught it, species, weight, price, but all the other information that's in there, you need to have another entity, the other countries that are doing that. And so to control the illegal fishing of the toothfish, for example, Camlar came into being a number of years ago, and there's re requirements of the countries that are members of that on the catch side, while we have the requirements on the importing and purchasing the, the commerce side. So that's why these programs work. And I'm going to go into a little bit of detail and show the, the depth and the work by, by our NIPS people, what it takes to do this work. But again, with a presidential one, it's, it's a kind of unilateral saying, OK, now this is, we're the market. We are going to start tracing this stuff. But there's no RFMO behind it. And um, to give you an idea of, of the difficulties we face doing this. So, um, so the RFMO, um, there's two of them specifically we deal with, the CAMLAR, that's how we say that, Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic M Marine Living Resources. Um, Kim Gwynn, who, who manages that program, she's going to get a plane and fly to Hobart, Australia, Tasmania, I guess, in a couple weeks, because that's where that, is, that organization is, is based. And it's for toothfish. Um, the other one is ICAT, that's the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas, and that's over in Europe, I think Spain. So those are the two main, that's, so that's two that we deal with. <clears throat> so Cam, that's the Patagonian toothfish, that's Chilean sea bass, that's the other one we know it as. Um, again, they, they've already had an electronic database. The data is entered by the importer, and this data the importer then has to get from who he bought it from, from the vessel or the company, goes back, and they have to put in all that information in, into a database that these group of, that Camler has already done, and then we can see it. Now they'll have to put the, 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 the commerce data into the ACE, but the rest of this is still here for us to see. So because this is a frozen product, we actually can it's usually on the water, but approve or not approve and control the illegal fishing part of it, of this product when it comes to America. So this is, a, this is something that's been developed for a number of years and um, works, works really well. And so that's one of the agents. That, that is a, not, that, there's a human being there, but the non-human there, that is a, a Patagonian toothfish, a Chilean sea bass. There's another name for that, and I forget what it is. But those are the two that, that I know it by. Um, and that's, that's an example. Um, every now and then, they, they, they've been very high profile. They catch some of these long liners who aren't part of this scheme, don't have the license with the fishing nations, the flag, and chase them down and catch them, hopefully. And ours is sometimes these vessels that aren't permitted, whatever, somebody, and I won't say who or countries or hacking systems or any of that, um, will buy them and try to sell them. And the US is the main market. And they won't be able to, because they won't be approved. So that as actually happens in the two years that I've been, been here now. So it, it's a system that works, but it's got buy-in by, I don't I forget exactly how many questions, uh, questions how many um, countries that are involved, but 20 or so, so that that's how that system works to control IUU illegal, unreported, underreported fishing of, of toothfish. And this is from one of Kim's recent reports. This is the amount of documents, this annually, that this program in, in Pascagoula, Mississippi, is able to review to control this, um, this whole um, program of um, illegal reporting, underreporting, impo importing of toothfish. So it's, you know, it's in the, over the thousands. And this represents multi-millions dollars worth of toothfish. It's a highly priced fish, seafood, that people pay a pretty good dollar for. If you ever had it, it's thick, white fish. Changing over to the other RFMO, which is I ICAT. And that's the tuna one on the Atlantic side. So it, it monitors bluefin. Um, it just 
Kim spent the last year of her life actually putting together a new electronic catch database system. And I can see the confusion because hold it, didn't we just talk about this new one for, for customs? And of course they rolled out about the same time in typical government fashion. But um, so that, that's for that um, RFMO, which is 26 countries in Europe monitoring the catch of, of bluefin tuna. So they have their own system and that does translate into the new customs one. So you can see it just gets, you really have to know if you're the importer or the dealer to know what's going on, but it's very much the electronification, that's the word I love to use, of this whole, it all, was all paper documents beforehand. It's faxing in the old days, now it's uploading. And so, so now it's, um, it's, it's all on an electronic system, which helps a lot for the reviewing and monitoring of the trade, which is what we do. Um, swordfish is an interesting one that it's worked. It's when they started it, there was a lot of they were cons it wasn't so much illegal unreported. It was just the overfishing of the stock. And so being able to monitor where it came from again, these multiple countries so that the, the pr program continues, but it's, it's met its goal of, um, um, controlling the overfishing and, and, and management of the resource. So it's another success story. So these, I guess the reason I mentioned that, it's so we're involved in the day-to-day -day data collection and monitoring of this data and, and, and documents. But when you have the multiple countries and meeting these obligations they agree to, these programs can work to, to control if it's for um, management of the resource or illegal and unreported um, um, fishing. So there is, those are the positive stories that come out of here. And so a lot of times when it's like, hey, that's the positive people here, this is what, oh great, so well, let's add a bunch of new species. And that's kind of where we come in from and there's political parts of that, ENGOs, a lot of different things saying we need to monitor all this stuff. And if you remember from a previous slide, the big part that started what we had to do and we had some input, it's, it's the principles. Okay, sure, you can monitor everything, but if, that, if you can't control the data, if, is there a risk to it? If, if, there's, if the industry is going on fine without the issue, so there's a there's a lot of winnowing down to which do, which species are really important, and then from our viewpoint at Nissel, a lot of times it's like, well, if we're part of an organization, we know the data coming in, we have some agreement of of its worthiness. If it's just us, and it's like, okay you need to have this, this information because you're importing this tuna. Well, you go and put in the code. Well, which code am I going to put in? One code describes it. The other doesn't really describe it that well, but I don't need the documentation. I'm sure no fish or seafood importer would ever do anything like that. But um, so there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of intricacies to this that don't meet the eye when it's like we need to trace everything. <clears throat> OK, and again, the scope for the work we do on an annual basis. As you can see, it's just, we have seven or eight people in this program looking at documents, putting it together, being able to report back to the RFMOs of what's being imported into the US and, and documenting it. And sometimes there's, there's actions that have to be handled. We, we report to enforcement if there's issues. So it's, it's, it's quite a big setup that's going on right now. But again, it's for these species that are involved with the regional fishery management organizations, which is a collection of different countries. So they're ones that many countries have gotten together and said, we need to monitor this for either illegal or, 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 or management of the stock or whatever the reasons are. And they agree, this is the system we're going to do. And it's, if you're involved in, in the government, you know, or even the industry, you know, that, that just it's a big under, undertaking. And there have been some success stories. So that's kind of the background that I had for, for that. Uh, uh, another lousy um, segue, totally different. So there's a third part of my talk, and this is a little something I'm more interested in, and it's, um, it's, a, it's a biotechnology program, if you will, um, kind of back to the future. It's, we're not looking at CRISPR genes or RNA or DNA. It's, it's actually looking at proteins. Stuff, you say, that's, that's 20 years old. I remember doing that in graduate school, something like that. But it's, it's really a unique thing that, that's been being developed for a while in our lab. And it's, it's a rapid, so it's rapid. So the, the goal is, this is kind of on the seafood fraud. You get a, you, and you all have heard this is in the news. You have some fish, it's a fish fillet, and they say it's snapper. Well, is it really snapper? 
right? Well, it's 10 bucks, it's gotta be Snapper. Well, maybe it isn't, you know, that kind of thing. So, and, and Oceana and different NGOs have gone out and done studies, oh, 20%, 80% is not really what you think it is. And, and again, that there are different ways of, it's always in the sample collection to come up with those results. But that always involves DNA analysis. That's how they determine, is this really a grouper or is this a BASA? It, what is it? So as that program has developed, and the FDA has more than one little lab in Pascagoula, so they've had a lot more resources and developed a, and, and developed a library of DNA fingerprints. It's, it's very robust. They're doing a lot of good work. In the meantime, our, our little lab worked on this rapid ID technique and this is the part I like, being this, this, the, the industry outreach guy. It's using aqueous extraction of protein. Honestly, a little bit of mint seafood in water, shake it up. That's your extraction. So, sounds good for, um, you know, cost, of course. Um, even safety, right? You're not using um, harsh chemicals, all this good stuff. Rather ingenious. So, and it's using chip-based capillary electrophoresis. Electrophoresis, I remember that. Putting it in the, in, the, in the solution and then turning on the electricity and see the protein band separate. That's 1990 or 80 or whatever it is. But this is now on a chip, on a piece of equipment that you can buy off the shelf. So it's much done, much more rapidly and controlled by a machine. And what we've done is developing this, this methodology of using an aqueous extraction, separating the protein bands, then we've built a library of authenticated fin fish species protein patterns. So, because we rent from the fishery scientists, the marine biologists, when their boats go out to do their surveys, they'll bring them in and we'll, we will know what they are. We have a fisheries, a government fisheries biologist say, this is a lane snapper, this is a sea robin, whatever it might be, and then we will do this, um, um, methodology and have a, build a library of known products from this method. And the goal is to develop this first thing was to develop the method and, and validate and make sure it works. And the second one then is to build this library of these common industry products that might get trans switched either by on purpose or by accident or whatever so that a, that a, um, a, a snapper really is a snapper. So this is kind of the promo part of it. The DNA sequences are, are, use, are what you use now. They're very high, costly, low throughput, and high degree of specificity. Of course, there are people out there coming up with more rapid DNA kits, and of course, and that's all good. Um, but this, this, is a, this is a, so this is a, a not using DNA. It's a protein pattern, so it's not as specific. There's some limitations, but it's just as a screening, it's inexpensive, and it can tell you the difference you may not be able to tell you it's a lane snapper or a red snapper or a mangrove snapper, but it definitely knows if it's a snapper instead of a, a bassa or a tilapia, which is what the, com the industry solutions are focused on. So it's rapid. I say a half a day, but it, it's quicker than that. Simple water extraction, off-the-shelf chips and an analyzer from um, Agilent, right? Bioanalyzer, Authenticated Species Library, that's what we bring to the, we're the, the federal government the, with, with our um, marine scientists um, authenticating the species. And, and the real interesting part is our chemists actually develop this algorithmic software program that you put in the band, you do the, you do the, the extraction, the iso, electro iso focusing, and you get the bands, you put it into the software, push the button, and it tells you what the species is, if we have it in our library. Obviously, we don't have everything yet. So it's very simple, very rapid, and um, it works. <clears throat> so um, yeah, so we, um, industry, common industry substitutions. Um, cannot, yeah, I just went over that. Also, things like tuna and other things that are very close. There's some differences because it's species to species, but it's, it's evolving. We're just getting this going. and. Um, it can't be used for cooked mussel because it's protein, so that's a limitation. And right now we're only working on fin fish. So it's just getting started, but it's, again, a very rapid method that will have some application. Um, and then some more explanation with some pictures. So um, that's kind of it. That's the guy doing his work, determining what exactly species that fish is. Um, and that's it. That's the extraction right there. 
So you don't need a PhD. Maybe keep us PhDs out of the way. I don't know. But uh, so it's it's simple to do. Um, you you put your extract on the chip there. That's so. Oh, oh yeah, I'm gonna use the pointer. No, I'm not. <laughs> that one. Okay, so there's wells in there, you know, typical stuff. You put it in there, and that's the uh, analyzer. You put it in that, that drawer right there. It goes in and gives you peak heights, like a, transforms the bands into peak heights. Um, then this is the proprietary um, software. You, you enter up here. There's, there's rows. It's Right now it's an Excel spreadsheet. There's going to be work to make it more and more user friendly and put on a website that's all in the development phase right now but you do that it this is how it works it's matching all these things in, into the known library that's only going to grow to all these spikes all these peaks excuse me and it comes up with a match <laughs> so um so where are we now with this we've been work this has been working on a lot of time but again it's been there's been other, we're a small lab and, and it's not the, the, the critical responsibilities we have to do, so we keep going back and forth. But we're at the point, it's supposed to happen this week, I'm gonna get the manuscript to start our internal review. So we need to publish the manuscript, get that peer reviewed. Um, we're also in starting with an inner lab validation with another um, government lab that we, we're, we're friendly with because great, we can do it, we know what we're doing. Hopefully somebody else can do it too. That's the goal with that. So both of those things have to be done. And then we're working with our, um, our corporate office, our headquarters, to come up with a way to transform this really unique and in in interesting um, d software tool is done with Excel and, and bring it into a more modern and usable form. So we've got a little ways to go, but we're really on the threshold of getting this to a point that can be useful. I know I've made this presentation now, I've been here two years, and it's coming, it's coming, but it's, I mean, it's, I always usually get two responses. One is just like, proteins, that's, again, 20 years ago, or, wow, that seems like something I could use. When are you gonna be done with it? And so that's the point we like to focus on. Um, yeah, and that's kind of what we're doing in a nutshell. There's other things we're doing, but I didn't want to, put everyone to sleep for too long. So uh, thank you very much. Any more questions now? Or if, I, if there's any I can answer? Or yeah, do we you want to wait to the end? Now? That's what everyone. We have questions now. OK. Some, yeah. Somebody was awake. All right. That's good. You want me to go around yes, and with my I, I can talk really loud. Is that going to be Yes, you can. Time? I agree with that. Yes. Is that OK? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you want OK. Order. All right. Yeah. We'll hand it to you. So how did is this on? Yeah, there we go. Um, how does the magic box work? What is the technology that Agilent is using? No, um, so it's 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 some, some algorithm um, pattern matching. So it's matching. It, what it does is it goes through all of our library. We have um, multiple um, re specimens, replicates, and then I think it's thirteen different bands that are. Is it size based? So protein size based, or yeah? They're, so they're they're separated. Okay, right. They're they're they're, they're yeah. the, the muscle proteins that are separated out, okay. and it's the only the ones that are show up in the top ten. There's, so there's these limitations that are put on it for the matching stuff to work, and, but it goes through each one. Okay. I, I hope that explained it. Yeah. Obviously, it's not mine. Okay. I didn't develop it's not it. Called the John Bell no, it's got somebody box. else's name on it. Believe me. Yeah. yeah. Behind you. What is the situation when it's further processed and cooked and or the proteins are stay behind the podium ah <laughs> no um so it's uh it, they're they're coagulated right so it, they there we have the one thing we've tested is frozen storage that that maintains its its um specificity for that but if it's cooked it's out. What about if it's uh, things like pickled herring and things like that? Can you? We, we, that's a very good question, and those are all these questions that we're, we have to determine. But I kind of the vision that I have with it is we get it out there, and if it's useful, it'll be used. And if it's useful and used, there will be a lot of smart university people like, like yourself that'll say, hey, why, why, why don't we try to use <laughs> some other extractive and we can make, do other things? And that, that's what I kind of see happening. But we, we're not that to that point yet.
Hey, Dr. Bell, just a quick question. Um, what do you see the usage of this, mainly for regulatory, mainly for actual like end user, like the importers, or you know, what do you think that's the use for this particular method? Well, thank you, and that's, and that's a good question, and I, I keep looking where Jack's not, because it's, I'm bringing what I believe, in, and I'm an in, from the industry, and I, I see this as a real opportunity for the people who are my clientele in Louisiana and the bigger, like the Kroger's, you know, to say, okay, we just paid X for this thing because it's, it's a grouper, and I just want to quickly determine that it, that, it, that it's grouper or close to it. It's not BASA. So it, it's that. So I could see also state regulatory agencies who are doing, getting more and more into this work. They can screen this stuff quickly, and then if they're not sure, then they have the DNA test to Determ to further determine it, or if you're going to go to court. So it's not. So if you're going to go to court, if you then you're going to have to get a DNA where it'll stand up. But this is just a rapid screening. So I see it more useful for the trade, but also for for regulatory labs. Again, to as a screening. Nobody's asking about the trade stuff. I saw the, I saw people with their eyes closed during that one. John, what's the cost? Right. So um, it's it's. You know, you do it in bunches and all that, but it's less than a dollar a cost. I'm sorry, a, a, do, a, a little over a dollar. So, but what's the cost of the investment in the machine? Right, so 20000 I believe, is the cost for the unit, and the chip, which runs X amount, comes out to be less than a, about a dollar. So if the industry is interested in the sampling, is there a way that they sample and send it to somebody else? Is that your vision? Thank you. No, I, and I didn't express that well. No, the vision is we put the website, put a, put a website up there that has the new and improved pattern matching software so that you at, at your, your lab probably will do it, get the, the, um, the peaks out of this, and there's numbers associated with the peaks, go to the website or download and have it and put it into that, put those peak kites, just enter it into the software tool, and then the, so then the software tool will then say it is this. So you can do all that at your own location. Pictures of fish will come up to show you what it is. I mean, there'll be other information. So own location still means not industry sites. No. Um, so again, I, I use Kroger as an example okay. because they probably have, I know they do, they have QA labs where they have this capability. Okay. So down to that level, not at a point of sticking a, a thing and, oh, it's a, it's not that. Okay. Okay. Well, I have a question about the trade stuff because uh, I'm really not that familiar with it. Um, so one of my, my question is, um, the new system, one of the new systems that you talked about putting in place for the toothfish, you said it's already being effective. And I'm, I'm just wondering how you're monitoring and how you're measuring that effectiveness. Right. So, um, <clears throat> so to import toothfish in the U.S. to have a buyer it has to go through customs, and you ha and now. The new system is, is, is up, but even now, you, the dealer, has to send the documentation that shows the capture part of it, the traceability, to um, NISL, to Pascagoula, where we are, and we have people who are actively matching the customs entry stuff with the documentation. Now they'll just need to go in the computer. You won't, nothing will have to be sent on paper. And that's actually reviewed. Every single one of those documents is reviewed to match these things up. And it works so well with Toothfish because it's a frozen product. So it can be on the sea while we're doing the monitoring. So before it actually hits whatever port it's coming to, it can either be approved or not by the documentation saying, yes, this is a legitimate importer who got it from a legitimate flagged vessel from one of the Kamlar countries, and it's tracked all the way through. So it's, it's very difficult if it's a raw product, obviously. A lot of times now that's after the fact. That's a big reason for this new ACE portal, that it can be a little more real time, that we can go into the computer and look at it and do at least a preliminary look at it. But for the reporting, which is always after the fact, to, to the organization, all of those documents and is, is, are looked at and put together. And if there is an enforcement action, NIMPS has an enforcement division. They work with um, Customs and Border Patrol. And so there have been instances where this work has stopped illegal fishing, uh, stopped the import of illegal fishing to happen. 
Any other questions before we go on to our next speaker? And, and so that's the, just, I'd want to make this one, and maybe I already emphasized this, but that's, that's, the, that's the idea of saying, well, then we can you know, track, let's look at all the shrimp. Shrimp's important because there's so much, we eat so much shrimp. Or all these other um, abalones on that list. They've they got this list of the next ones to do it. But if you don't have the documentation of the capture or growing or anything to come in the outside, it's going to make it very difficult to, tr to truly trace a bit with any real knowledge or belief or trust. Oh, trust. Here we come again to trust. Okay. Thank you again. Okay. Thanks, John.